Hello AOS fans, Robin here, and I'm back again with a, another look at Soulbound for you. I've been gradually working my way through the rules and sort of talking about them, and today I'm looking at tests. They form the backbone of many a role-playing game, and Soulbound is no exception. Before we dig into the tests, there was a little interesting uh, sidebar at the beginning of this chapter called Help the GM Out. Now, as a long-time GM, I'm always looking for ways in which I can be helped out, so I've read this with interest. And it talks about the sort of pact between players and GM uh, to uh, generate a good game, I suppose. I tend to see it, I mean, I know some people do tend to see role-playing games as an adversarial thing of the players versus the GM, which, of course, it really shouldn't be. Uh, but this is a really interesting idea of the players kind of, uh, the, I say the impetus on the players to help the GM create a really great game. Um, so it's kind of talking about here about how um, players can learn their tests for the system, for their characters, so that they know what they're doing uh, when playing, which is kind of the antithesis. Not the antithesis, but it's kind of different to how I've tended to play games in the past. I tended to play with uh, relatively inexperienced players, I suppose, at first, although um, my group's been running a long time now. But as a GM, I tend to take the responsibility for knowing the system. Um, but perhaps I've been looking at it wrong, and I found this way, uh, I found this quite refreshing, this way of looking at it. So um, I think it's really a really positive thing to talk about how uh, sort of collaborative the game is. And after all, you're all trying to work together to create a really nice story um, that you all enjoy. And obviously the experience should be enjoyable for everybody and not horribly stressful for the GM. So it says the GM will do everything they can to make sure you have a good time. So be sure to know how your character works. It is your responsibility to make running the game as easy as possible for the GM. So help them out. So uh, well done. Uh, Emmett Byrne and the team who wrote this game uh, for, for putting that in. I think it's a really nice touch and um, I, I don't I haven't seen it before in any other role-playing games. I haven't read that many modern systems so perhaps it's standard form now. I don't know but I, I really liked it and I think it really embodies Cubicle 7's attitude towards role-playing games as a sort of huge collaborative effort for everybody to have a great time. But let's take a deeper dive into tests. And the first thing to do when uh, defining the test in the game is to look at the difficulty number. Uh, many things it says you'll succeed automatically when you don't have a role playing system where you, you, know, you test to see whether you can climb a ladder or draw your sword. Uh, but uh, where it's a bit more difficult, you use tests. Okay, so I mean, as I've said, this is the bread and butter of many role playing games. Wolfrop has full of tests, uh, D&D has tests, and they all have tests. Uh, and in this case, you have difficulty numbers, which are set by the GM. And this is the DN, and you see this DN everywhere in the book. Um, and so there are two elements to it. There's the difficulty of the test. And this is the first number of the test, and the higher this first number is, uh, the harder it is to achieve. And if you remember, you roll a number of D6 equal to your score um, the, on a particular stat, and then you get extra dice if you have got training in in a particular attribute or a particular skill that uses the attribute, you get pluses to, to additional dice. But obviously, if you've got a difficult number of six, it's much, much harder to do than if there's a difficulty number of one because you're trying to roll over the difficulty number. The second element is the complexity. Some more complex tasks require that you're successful on more than one dice roll. So you might be rolling three dice, but you might actually have to get over the difficulty number on all three of the dice that you're rolling, which makes it obviously harder to do. Um, so they're shown, anyways, in the book, as I've just said, as difficulty number X, comma, Y, um, with the attribute and the skill that you're using. And X is the difficulty and Y is the complexity. Uh, so, as I've pretty much just said, but uh, the test of difficulty 4 or complexity 2 is shown as difficulty number 4, 2. So you'd need to roll um, two values above, four, 4 and above, in order to successfully complete that test um, using uh, dexterity skill. Uh, which is body and channeling is three four so you'd only have to roll over three but you'd have to do it four times um, and that uses the mind uh, attribute and channeling skill and following on from that as i've already said uh, the number of dice you roll when making a test that's referred to as your dice pool and your dice pool is determined by your attribute score plus the level of training with the skill being tested so if your attribute score is three and the relevant skill is you've got training of one then you would roll four dice and so on it's pretty straightforward in the game we see three types of test 
Um, the first one is a common test and by their name you'll see these more often than not um, and they're generally just tests um, and their immediate tasks not directly opposed by another party such as leaving over a gap so they're kind of like tests of your personal ability if you like uh, things that you do, can or can't do opposed tests are when you're trying to uh, outwit or best another party in direct competition um, and this is an opposed test now post tests quite often are the backbone of role-playing games um, or not the backbone but they quite often make up uh, some of the more complicated mechanics but this one is pretty straightforward i'll come on to exactly how it works uh, but it basically is both of you are trying to succeed against a uh, set uh, difficulty number which the gm is, is it creates by the uh, gm and the person who achieves it best uh, is the winner more complicated and something i haven't necessarily got my head around yet are extended tests so these happen over the courses of days weeks or even months um, and they but they seem to be slight things that kind of happen between games in between sessions when you're off in your off time you're trying to learn a new engine for your rig as it says or try to learn a new language things that take time uh, and that you can work on and the sort of thing you would go you would tell your gym well i'm going to try and do this and he would say well you make these tests and if they work it works and something you might i suppose you might do it in the background of your game so you could learn a new language i suppose if you said you were practicing in between quiet times when you're resting at camp or what have you uh, but that is a uh, it is a more complicated uh, but you've got more time to kind of sit and work them out how they might actually work um, and they often require a greater number of assesses than can be achieved in a single roll so they might have to you might say have to roll uh, take off the top of my head but you might have to make several successes over a number of weeks to learn a new language so in the, if you make your first test you can say who you are and where you live uh, maybe but if you make the second test you can go on to talk about your hobbies so let's have a little look at difficulty so as mentioned already the difficulty test is the number uh, you must equal or exceed on a dice for it to count as a success some tasks are simple such as kicking you down, down a door or jumping over a gap and they require one success so they are the simplest types of test some require additional successes and they are the ones that involve more complex tests that's it's pretty straightforward so here are the difficulty numbers explained um, so if it's very easy, you just need a difficulty number of two on one dice. Going all the way up to very hard, uh, which is six, you need a success of six. And be scaling a sheer cliff face made of smooth glass as opposed to climbing up a wall with various climbing up a tree, climbing a rocky outcropping, climbing a rocky outcropping during a storm. You can see there's a kind of sliding scale of difficulty. Now, should you always roll? Well, sometimes yes and sometimes no. I mean, that's a bit of a wishy-washy answer, isn't it? But it is a great, as the, they're often a pace of stress, as I've said already. It's about the storytelling in this game. So if rolling the dice doesn't improve the story, isn't like to improve the story if they fail or whether they, even if they pass, then just don't make the test. Don't break the flow of the game uh, by stopping everybody to roll dice. I think that's the method, the message in that uh, little segment there some tests might be simple yet somehow complicated or at least take a long time for example if a character is looking for something in a cluttered room it's not a difficult task you could do it but it'll just take a little while so it might have a higher complexity because you might have to roll several successes before you find what you're looking for so let's have a look then at the bread and butter of the game and that is common test these are the things your character will be making most of the time hopefully not too often hopefully you'll be able to kind of just role play your way through but every now and again you will have to roll some dice and most of the time you're going to be rolling dice for these kind of common tests as you try to perform some sort of feats and marvelous acts of daring do well i say daring do but it described the rule book describes common tests as things like attempting to pick a lock which is obviously pretty staple of any role-playing game singing a bawdy tune to entertain a group of weary soldiers that seems to be a warhammer thing the designers seem to be obsessed with light entertainment um, and finally maybe lifting a fallen tree from atop an ally which is definitely heroic uh, particularly from the point of view of the person who's lying underneath it so the rule for a common test is pretty simple once you've got your dice pulled together say the number of dice you need to roll uh, you try to roll or exceed the difficulty number of the test and then if you have focus in that skill remember that you can modify a dice roll so you can add one pip or if you've got double focus you can add, actually go up two, pip, two pips or two pips on separate dice so you can either do a plus two or two plus ones each die that equals or exceeds the difficulty of the test counts as success if your total success is equal or exceed the complexity of the test then it is succeeded 
and if you manage to achieve no successes or you'll get less successes than the complexity of the task then you've failed it. So it is pretty straightforward and it's the same for every single type of common test in the game. So once you've got up and running, once you know how to quickly put your dice board together and the GM, if he's got a handle on his difficulty numbers, then actually the game should run very, very smoothly. I really like that system. So let's have a little look at opposed tests now. Opposed tests are when two characters are in direct opposition. So you need an opposed test and they are used when he's trying to get the better of another character or uh, or maybe sneaking past a guard or fast talking away past a witch hunter or trying to outrun a hungry moor crusher. Um, and when two characters take part in an opposed test, they both try and meet or exceed a DN determined by the GM. A DN determined by the GM, so a difficulty number determined by the gaze master. And these characters here, I think, tends to mean NPC and player character, although obviously you could have a post test between two player characters. And there's a default uh, difficulty number of 4 to 1, which of course doesn't mean 4 to 1 at all, and demonstrates the perils of trying to read while uh, talking. Uh, it's a difficulty number of uh, 4 with a complexity of 1. Um, so you know, basically you've just both got to get one success of four and depending on the results um, you, you, whoever gets the best result will be the most successful and win, win the opposed test and um, it is possible for the situation to change if there's some reason why one of the characters making the test has advantage or disadvantage then the actual sort of standard difficulty number uh, might shift so it's interesting to see that actually for a post test there is kind of a standard GM given template uh, of, of complexity one and difficulty number four so here's an example of an opposed test um, Anika a witch elf of the daughters of Cain is trying to escape from a rat ogre um, she darts through a doorway of a crumbled warehouse in the Emerald Guard docks and slams the door behind her, trying to hold it closed. The rat ogre roars and starts smashing its fist against the door, splintering the wood. And in this example, the GM will call for a, a pose test because Anika and the rat ogre, between Anika and the rat ogre, to see if they can hold, if Anika can hold the door closed. So, yep, yeah, here we go. You've got two people facing off on each other, and they will both roll their pool of dice, and the person with the most successes would win so in this case it's probably going to be the, the character or npc that's the bigger and stronger that's likely to pull it off so in this case you'll probably see the rat ogre rolling more dice than the um, dark elf so a brief note on advantage and disadvantage uh, as i said that sometimes uh, one side or the other in an opposed test might have advantage or disadvantage and if you've got advantage then the difficulty test is easier so the difficulty is reduced to three and you still only need one success um, and but if you had disadvantages for some reason it was more difficult for you then you would need to roll five um, and it does say that you can occasionally get uh, pips of two in either direction so it's a greater disadvantage or greater advantage uh, but these are rare um, so that's an interesting concept and the question, other question it does arise is if you if one person has advantage does the other person always have disadvantage and this is covered in the rules uh, although only a little bit but i say not necessarily they do sometimes go hand in hand but not always um, maybe if uh, one party was run, trying to run away while somebody was trying to shoot them maybe they were running on slippery ground or something like that i don't know or being partially blinded but again you can depend on how the situation is both sides might have if you're trying to fight if one of you is blinded it's harder for you to hit and it's probably easier for the other person to hit you it does kind of come down to the gm's discretion um, if both sides are affected by whatever's causing the advantage slash disadvantage now there are some circumstances where characters might be in opposition without realising it. Um, if you're trying to sneak past something, uh, keep one character or an NPC um, unaware of your presence as you're trying to sneak into the vault or something, then uh, you'll be making a pose roll against um, the opponent's natural awareness. If it's a PC natural awareness, that's uh, on their character sheet or was measured by their mind stat plus any training they had in the awareness skill. Uh, divided by two for our monsters and NPCs. Um, this is given in the in the beastry, uh, but can be calculated. So imagine that you work out what the, it would be if it was an opposed roll, so if they were awake and somebody was trying to sneak past them, and then uh, divide that number by two. So it's pretty straightforward, really. One interesting mechanic is that of extended tests. This is perhaps a little bit hard to get your head around without kind of playing in earnest, but um, these things tend to occur, I think, between adventures. So you've got extended tests 
Some tasks, such as crafting a suit of armour, or etheric armour, or fostering a network of informants can take weeks or months to accomplish. Uh, for tasks with little time pressure that require focus and dedication, the GM can make the characters make uh, extended tests. So it's kind of like you pick something quite complicated that you want to do, and then you make an extended test. So how do they work? The GM needs to determine how what the difficulty number is, and this difficulty number will be massive, uh, suggesting the rule book somewhere between 10 and 20. And then the GM will also need to determine how much time this will take. So maybe it will take three months, maybe it will take six months, or maybe it will just be two or three weeks. Um, it all will depend on the nature of the test. Um, and then the GM has to determine the, n the total number of attempts you can make. And then if you haven't succeeded, you haven't got enough uh, sort of successes after doing say I don't know you need 20 successes after having maybe 30 tests over three months then uh, the test is a failure and the GM obviously also has to determine how often you can take the test which again very much going to depend on the nature of the uh, thing you're trying to do and so quite often I think I feel like this is one of those cases where roles might not be needed it's all going to depend on a little bit of role playing a little bit of planning on the character's part uh, but there could be some things which are very much you can't really plan how to build a massive etheric engine and therefore this kind of is kind of a set way in which you're looking at uh, accomplishing uh, that particular feat or, or endeavor so how do you determine the difficulty number for this kind of test? Well, they um, suggest that you uh, divide the total number of successes required by the number of attempts allowed. And obviously the higher that ratio, the harder it is. So if you have got to get 16 successes in four attempts, then that's going to be pretty tough unless you're very, very skilled because you've got to roll four successes in each go. But if you were doing it over eight attempts, you only have to roll two, which would be significantly easier. And I guess you would balance that out uh, with your GM uh, to sort of determine how exactly you're going about the test and what uh, measures you're taking to um, um, sort of improve your chances of success. What skills might you use? Well, again, that's determined by the GM, but again, it might uh, involve a discussion with your with the player and the GM determining how they're going to do it. So the GM determines what attributes and skills are pertinent to the test, and it will usually be the same skill. But not necessarily, um, because um, for each attempt the GM may decide other skills have come into play, depending on the discussions you've had with them. I um, mean, it may be that you need to use your law skill to do some researching, and then haggle for parts, and then maybe craft and complete the work. Similarly, if you're trying to set up a network, there might be some stealth involved, or you might have to do some uh, guile for, for sort of haggling for working out uh, contacts and things. So the, the, there's quite a lot of possibility with the extended test, which I really, really like. Um, and again, um, it may have other factors which are going to depend on discussions with the GM and the, thing, the measures you take to make it successful. For example, there's no point trying to you know, set up a, a net spy network in a village of two people. Similarly, you're not going to be able to uh, acquire, acquire all the ore you need in the middle of town, unless you go to the market maybe, but you're not going to be able to set up a mine and dig up what you want. All that is going to have a bearing on your chances of success and how your extended test is going to go. I actually really like this mechanic. I find the off period between adventures can be tricky. I always have great designs of what I'm going to do, but it's quite nice to have a, a formalized process for these kind of longer overarching kind of story developments of your character and give them give them a way of business way of giving them advanced goals and just building up and rounding out your character because so they can do interesting things all the time, not just when there's a dungeon or an enemy in front of them. One final element of the testing chapter or section is this thing called degrees of success. And you can be successful, but you can be super duper uber successful and get a little boon for that, which is quite nice. So if, if you get equal to the difficulty number, if you pass it, so you, you, know, you, need, you need three successes and you get three successes, you've completed the task. No more no less if you did it with flying colors so maybe you got uh, two uh, successes greater than that required you complete the task and gain a, gain a minor benefit this could be completed with flair learning additional information or gaining a bonus die on a future test related to that task if you were lucky enough to be uh, get three uh, successes greater than the difficulty number um, you complete that task and gain a major benefit um, which might be doing it fast, um, doing something you know, something unexpected like recovering some lost or secret information and maybe gaining a bonus dice on task relating to that task for the next 24 hours. So obviously it's a bit fortunate, you'll be a bit lucky, but it's giving you a little bit of bonus for that luck. And this mechanic has been around in uh, all sorts of role-playing games for a long time. 
kind of bonus for rolling well. It's your, it's your equivalent of a critical hit, kind of formalised across all tests, which I kind of like. And I assume that would include combat tests too. So if you were lucky to have a, an enormously all brilliant all-out attack, you would uh, the confidence of that would take you through you know, for a few, the next 24 hours as you live out, dine out on your battle escapades. And that's it for Warhammer AOS Soulbound tests. Um, I hope you found that interesting. Hope you found it useful. I um, really like the way these mechanics are stacking up. Looking forward to trying them out. Still haven't played, uh, but um, people in the UK are going to start moving around a little bit more soon, so maybe we can get a game in. We'll have to see. Um, I'm looking forward to trying out the mechanics. Next up in my next video, I'm going to talk about Metal and Doom. It should be a slightly shorter video. And the one after that, we're going to have a look at the combat system, which may be a little trickier, but we'll, we'll see how we go. Uh, so, um, and so I do hope you enjoyed that do like and subscribe if you did uh, do leave some comment ask a question or whatever you need uh, in the comments below and um, well, hopefully we'll see you soon uh, in the mortal realms bye